Hello everyone, welcome. I'm Emmanuel. I'm French, and this is Marika. She's German. We've been working at Telzacom for over two years now from our London office with the mission to grow our customer acquisition in Europe. My first focus was to grow our affiliate partnerships and influencer channel for France, but I am now focusing on our UK partnerships in UK cross-functionally. As for Marika, she has been leading the um, customer growth for affiliate partnership and influencer in Germany. Now, let me give you a little bit of our background on Tales.com because I assume not everyone will have heard of it. Our mission is to change the world of pet food for good. Back in 2013, a group of dog lovers came together to bring one vet's idea to life. And together, a team of experts, including engineers, nutritionists, vets, and of course, their dogs, developed a super smart way to create a unique recipe for every single dog. And we provide every dog with a bespoke feeding plan that includes a unique dry food blend, wet food treats, and other products. And we do this alongside um, other products like treats, I've already said that. <laughs> Apologies. Um, nerves. What's unique about this is we do this as a direct-to-consumer subscription and delivering over 8 million meals a month across our markets nowadays. And over the last past few years, we've also launched a UK supermarket range and branched out into Europe with France and Germany being a really big focus. And our goal is to really make every dog owner's life just that little bit easier by cutting out the challenge of finding the right food for their dog. So although subscription businesses have been around for a very long time, from Milkman to magazine subscription, the D2C subscriptions as we know it now is still pretty new, so we still have a lot to learn. However, what's great about uh, this model is that it utilizes advanced technology basically to offer amazing services to customers. And another good thing about uh, this model is that it, en it enables the creation of specialized boxes that give customers curated uh, and bespoke products that can't be found in the shop. And that's what, as a business, we're fo focusing on. Every dog is unique, so why should their food be different? So, how does it work? Let me introduce you to Sora. So, Sora is an um, eight-month-old crossbreed. So, she's still a young puppy, so she's very active. She enjoys chicken and beef, but she's not such a big fan of salmon. So, we will take all this information into consideration and create a unique recipe for Sora from a million possible uh, combinations. And this recipe will include everything she needs to support her health, like the right amount of proteins, minerals, and vitamins. But the, to make it even easier for the pet parent, we will include a free scoop, um, a portion scoop, to, and instruction on how much to feed the, the dog daily. And on, to top of it all, the, our subscription is fully flexible. So we can adapt the, the recipes, but also we full, give full um, control over the delivery dates. Uh, from posing to cancelling, so it can fit around lifestyle. So, when I first joined the company, I thought <laughs> the, all of this is amazing, but being a D2C subscription also has its challenges. For instance, we can't just create a beautiful packaging to put on, on the shelf to tempt our customer to try our product. So we have to find other way to reach out to our customers, which Maraca would uh, touch upon a bit later. And so our customers, have to try our product and services before starting to trust us. So um, that's why one of the, the, the key uh, challenge in acquisition is actually helping the customer understand exactly what we do at Elzacom. Because creating a unique recipe for every individual dog that adapts as the dog age is something that a lot of individual struggle to get their head around, especially when it doesn't cost much more than normal dog food. It's a level of personalization that we're not used to see in human food, let alone dog foods. And 
Getting the customer trust is even harder in certain markets, like, like here, for example, for us in Germany, where subscriptions are a lot less common than in the UK, for instance. That's why we usually have a very strong offer for the first month, so that once Sora has tried our food, she will be able to convince her pet, her pet parent to stay with us. How can you say no to that little face? <laughs> So, customer retention and loyalty are a key part of the subscription model. Once you've convinced your customer to try your product, it's even more important to convince them to stay with you. And there's many ways to do this, such as improving your services, your products, expanding your range. But in the end, it all comes down to, listen, to listening to what your customer wants. And at Tells.com, we are customer-centric. Every decision we make is based on data that we gather around our customers. But we're also team-spirited, because if you don't care for each other, how can you care for your customers? We make sure each day counts to stay uh, reactive to the customer needs, and we're a game-changer to continue to provide the very best product and services. So back to Sora. Now that we have all the answers to create a recipe, we will still um, adapt this recipe even further based on the additional product that our parents may add, for example, wet food or treats. So we personalize the box even further. And this sign-up flow is an essential part of the introductory experience to our brand and products. So we constantly optimize it. We also change the sign-up flow depending on the answer to the from the customers, so we can give some more relevant insight to the customer, but also we are giving them reassurance they are, they are choosing the right product for their needs, such as in this example regarding the skin and coat concern of the dog. And then from this sign-up flow, we will also look at all the data that we have available, such as Age, gender, breed size, health, how much wet food, how many treats, percentage of daily calories, favorite flavors, and so on. So we can fully understand what the customer wants and needs. And this is also the type of data that will help us determine the type of product we will launch in the future. And on top of that data, we will ask our customer experience to share the knowledge on our customers. So our customer experience team uh, at Telsacom is basically our customer service with a plus. They have received special training to be able to answer any dog-related concern. And so one great example I love to give is this uh, dog owner that every morning loves cooking scrambled eggs for a dog. This is something we can't capture in the sign-up flow. So in this instance, our CX team will liaise with our in-house vet to create a specific recipe for that particular customer based on this information that is unique to that customer. Our CX team will also get some time in touch with our customers when sadly their dog passes away and will send some flowers because the custom, our customers are part of our community and we know how hard this uh, event is. And talking about community, we have a very strong community on a closed Facebook group where we've created um, a, a safe place for our loyal customer to get exclusive content, but also to be just able to talk to other like-minded dog owners. So we really take um, our customer voice as a driver to our business. And that's why we're all about personalization, because any amazing uh, services is always personalized. And on, in our case, not only do we personalize our uh, experience, but we person, personalize our product up to having the name of the dog on its back. This, this is what sets us apart from other businesses. Our business was created to solve a problem at the heart of pet food, which was that despite an overwhelming choice of one-size-fits-all dog food in the shops, there were never something that could tick all the boxes. So there had to be a better way to fix dogs right. So we created our businesses around our customers to answer that problem. And, from, and we created a direct relationship with them that helped us amass a lot of knowledge. And from this knowledge, we've grown our brand. 
And last year, we've launched our first product in retails in the UK. And despite a completely different environment, we're working hard, uh, we're working hard to mirror the personalized experience to bring it in stores. So for instance, we've built a dedicated website for our retail customers where they will be able to learn the right amount of food to feed their dog, and they also will get a free scoop. So this added digital experience enables us to connect with our customers, but also to give them further support. Uh, for instance, we can remind them when to change the food when the dog reaches a certain age, and much more. So we know that the level of personalization is still very limited compared to our subscription, but we're working hard to improve it because there's so much more that can be done. And I think this is true wherever the customer is coming from. Now, the question is, how do we actually get these customers into the door in the first place? And being in quite a unique position in the market, as Emmanuel mentioned, there's obviously some of the really unique challenges that we face. One being, how do we balance a really localized approach with an cohesive brand story? Now, in the UK, for example, where we've been around for quite a few years, brand recognition is great. In France and Germany, where we've been around for two, maybe three years, we need to educate our audience a lot more. So when building our campaigns, we need to adapt our messaging to match those markets, of course. And we do this by still being very cohesive and making sure that we have one overarching message that we adapt on, because in fact, our proposition and mission is the same in all markets. So we use similar creatives, but maybe we choose some different dogs. Walter the Staffy is super popular in France, whereas Ruby, the golden retriever, responds a lot better here in Germany. And a collaborative approach with our insights team, our brand research, creative team, and of course, market channel owners, make it possible to streamline this. And we're able to take any learnings and insights from that localized team into our campaigns in the future and really knowing what we have to call out. Secondly, how do we combat ad blindness and stay relevant? And I know this is something a lot of us face every day. And we believe it's really time to be bold, but also to test and test and test. For us, that means having a budget to experiment. And it means having the means to test on new channels or with new opportunities. Because that way, you stay flexible. And you need to be aware of any shifts and algorithm changes on you know, Instagram. You need to be aware of mobile first trends or of any shopping habit changes. And keeping on top of that really does just lend us that flexibility to shift. And any new opportunities that come up, we can invest in and then make sure that we keep growing and then we keep being visible. And then how do we win trust? In the UK, we can really rely on great word of mouth benefits. And we're not quite there yet in Europe. So how can we make that happen? Because your parents probably haven't fed your childhooddogtails.com. And... If your dog's happy with the dog food, how do we make you change, especially to a brand that is a newcomer in the market? And the trick for us is to really hone in on the messaging. We make sure we educate, but we also make sure that we need our uniqueness stand out for ourselves. And then we have things like still buying regular kibble. That's just sad. So we do have a little bit of fun with it. So we, of course, need to take all of that into consideration when we build any branding campaigns and marketing campaigns. And for us, that means being diverse and not putting all of our eggs into a basket. We need to find the right mix of channels to both build brand awareness, of course, but also get those new customers in the door. And for us, this ended up looking like using traditional methods like TV or out of home with a strong combination of much more flexible channels. And that's just together has been our best recipe for success. Um, and especially that has just allowed us that flexibility to build on. Um, we're able to shift really flexibly when needed. When we look at Black Friday or Christmas, when Facebook ad spend is incredibly expensive, we can use a different channel to supplement and maybe run just as efficiently as the month before, but not pay that premium price. And of course, this also allows us to reach our customers across a really, really broad mix of channels and at a variety of touch points, meaning that we can run upper funnel activity like radio podcasts and then mix them with bottom of the funnel activities to get people in the door with ads on social media or across affiliates. 
And that focus on paid and earned media also allows us to really target the right audiences. And with really strong internal data insights and of course market research, we've really narrowed down who exactly our customer is. And that of course now allows us to build lookalike audiences, for example, to target, but also pick the right channels that we use and pick the right partners that we work with. And when we build campaigns, we often think digital first because we're a digital brand. This is where we truly feel the most at home. And there's so much content out there related to dogs on TikTok, on Instagram, on YouTube, on Reddit. On TikTok alone, videos take dogs have been viewed over 300 billion times. More than half of people post about their pet twice a week. One in six have a social media account for their pet. And there's, of course, everything from, you know, cute, crazy videos, photos, to people seeking advice and asking, what's the right food for my dog? So we know our audiences are there. And we really want to explore the opportunities. And that is beyond just your standard Facebook and Instagram ads, because that's just standard marketing practice nowadays. And those newer platforms like TikTok, Reddit, even still YouTube, sometimes even Instagram, just keep developing that portfolio of new opportunities. And with our broad channel mix, we can tap into this and make sure that we experiment with these. And especially now with in-feed ads on Reddit, we've, saw, for example, seen fantastic success. And we're just incredibly excited to see where it goes next and what else we can explore. Now, there's a few other high growth opportunities where we can reach those audiences. And it's channels that have largely been overlooked, we believe, in the last few years, but there's an incredible amount of potential in those. First up being affiliates. And it has a really bad reputation for being a cheap channel, of being really low quality customers. It's bargain hunters, they'll come in, they'll buy once, that's it. As a subscription, that's something we, of course, are really wary of because we want people to stick around. But the affiliate industry is worth over 17 billion US dollars a year. And that is huge potential. So we've decided to invest. And with the right mix of partners, the right offer, and an iron optimization, we have managed to grow this channel work and work really well for us. We've got a dedicated team in-house and an agency for support. And we now work with a fantastic conversion rate and it now drives over 25% of our new customer acquisition a year, which is pretty good. And partnerships, on the other hand, have a much more positive connotation. You know, we all think about great brand collaborations. We think about really high quality customers. It's those like-minded people to come in the door. And it used to be only a really small part of what we did. But over the last two years, we've now grown a cross-functional team across the business, led by Emmanuel, as she mentioned earlier. And we've managed to grow our acquisition by over a thousand percent in our core markets. Now, the key to that for us was to look beyond dog brands, the natural choice. Why not design greeting cards with a greeting card company and donate the proceeds to charity? Why not team up with another subscription brand and do insert swaps and boxes to reach those like minded audiences? The key to us really here is that variety and we have a decent budget in place for paid for opportunities. So something like card linked offers or checkout integrations on a CPA basis help, helped us considerably increase our goals here. Now, if someone was to ask us, what's the key to success for you? What does it look like? It's a bit hard to say because obviously everyone's goals look different and everyone's customers different. But there are a few learnings that we found have really helped us along the way and will continue helping us. Firstly, don't be afraid to test. It's so easy to just assume if something didn't work, that's not worth it. And sometimes you will need to iterate two, three, four times on, say, an email campaign to really hit those goals. But we found with that and perseverance and optimization and a good budget in place, it's really worth doing. Know your audience, of course. Use internal and external data to really hone in on who you're trying to target. And then, of course, find the right channels to target those people and get the right message across to them. Thirdly, don't worry about being the new kid on the blog. Now, we are quite a disruptor in the space, but we've made this our unique selling point. We love to stand out because there is a reason we are challenging the status quo. And lastly, and I think this is one we can't stress enough, 
diversify for that robust channel mix. There's so many opportunities out there that we can tap into. And A allows you to, of course, reduce the risk that you run, but also allows you to touch your customers across multiple channels and really reach those goals that you have. And now a few tips on how to become more customer-led in your decision-making. So first, <laughs> it's obvious, listen to your customer. But this is not only valid for your customer service, it's valid for the whole company. Make sure that your customer service is part of the rest of your company, uh, fully integrated and part as well of your strategies. Make, make customer-led your core value and reward your, your staff for uh, being customer-led. Because like this, they can engage with this value even further and keep it in the mind all the time. Create cross-functional teams so that they can share knowledge and learn from each other. I mean, this is very important to keep uh, customer experience continuity and to stay reactive as a business. Be flexible. So allow flexibility for your customers you know, to fit whatever you're offering around their, so it can fit around their lifestyle. Use data. I mean, everything you do to add value to the customer is based on data. The, the personalized experience, the added incentives, the, the great service, the great product, the great prices, the power of true real-time customer understanding. And finally, as Marika mentioned, test, test and learn. I mean, for us, we try never to assume we know what our customer most value or need. Instead, we will always, always test and learn. So I'm gonna give, leave you with that quote, which is, instead of focusing on the competition, focus on the customer. Thank you. Hi. Oh, Hi. That's very long, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm from a very different uh, industry, fashion. And one of the things that we struggle a lot is really trying to have personalization at a scale. And as far as I understand, well, I have a dog that eats tail.com. Every package is 100% personalized, right? So I get the dango, so his name on it, and the, the serving scoop and everything. Mm -hmm. How, how do you do it from an operation point of view? Like, how, how is that even possible that every product that goes out is 100% personalized? So this is um, basically the use of AI for um, algorithm. Sorry, my mic is keep following me. Um, so yeah, so this is basically getting the understand. I mean, we have developed uh, between um, a, a group of vets and um, a technology that will create the, the algorithm to establish what would be the right recipe depending on all the data that we have available around, around uh, different pets. So even, it would take also even a consideration on you know, certain breeds have health issues, and so we will take the, this information. And then the algorithm is also linked to our factory. So our factory will make the blend and it will be unique and it will basically give the right amount of protein and stuff and so every bag would be have its own blend made just after the first, um, basically the, the order. And that's why, for example, we have an in-house vet as well to make sure that there is a follow-up and we have a team uh, support as well for the vet. Um, but yeah, it is, uh, that's one of the things that we're proud that is over a million possible combination as opposed to other competitors who highlight the teller aspect, but it's not as unique uh, for each dog. I hope you answered your question. I don't know if I should stand. Um, can you share with us which channel has the, the, the best LTV for you, maybe? And if you have like some threshold um, <laughs> after which you know that the customer will, will stay for a long time, so maybe it's like three, three months and then you know that, yeah, so that's basically the question. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can take this one. So, um, Oh, it's, got, it's quite a really good question, actually, because I think it depends a little bit on the market. So we know partnerships, for example, is a really high-value channel for us. Um, and then PR-related activities often have a similar um, reach. Refer friend is really big for us, um, where the lifetime value is great. In terms of the benchmarking, I think that might be something we can chat a little bit about after, because um, we would have to go in quite a bit of detail. But I think essentially, once you're past the three months, the first three months of the trial, 
um, that's when we really see a really long lifetime. And we have people that have been with us for five years, one year. Um, so that's not uncommon for us to see. And also to, that, to add on this, um, I think the, the same way that Marika was saying about, um, you know, broad your marketing, um, this is valid as well for the LTV because you will have channels that will have a very really st uh, strong LTV like refer friends. But how many referrals are you going to get if you don't get customers? So you need to have other channels to bring the customer in. And that's where as well um, affiliates that we were mentioning that is always overlooked is bringing, is bringing the amount of people. Um, so if you have to, you can't really have a look at just the channel and its, uh, and its KPI. You have to have an over, overall look as well. I'm just going to, okay, just testing, yeah. Uh, how has your digital marketing strategy changed since you went into retail? Like, are you now driving Facebook ads to store locators or are you doing something to drive velocity in retail? So for us, um, because we've got a really strong retail partner in the UK, uh, Sainsbury's, I don't know if you heard, it's kind of similar to Reva, um, we get that visibility because we are in hundreds of stores. The idea is still to be uh, a subscription first and foremost, that's our core. So we don't actually advertise the shop or the supermarket range that much, we just take that organic, hey, you can get this in the supermarket, but ideally, the level of personalization that we can offer with a subscription it's just not the same that we get in the supermarket. So we see it as essentially another niche. We just know some people would like to shop in the supermarket, so we can provide that. But the core of the business will just remain as a subscription, and that we then also don't really adapt or cannibalize um, that traffic that might come through social. And I think the, all the marketing that we're doing for our subscription will have a positive impact as well for our retail, because they will just recognize the brand. Yeah. And similarly, we're doing TV ads, so people you know, will see the brand this way as well. Thank you. Um, one question, when you begin, how could you bring on the capital for a subscription system? Was it a kind of dropshipping system in the beginning or have you bought the dog food, mixed it by yourself and put it into boxes? Because I know that capital in the beginning is a big topic, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, we started out with the idea um, with our own production, essentially. So when it first launched, the, the idea was always like, we are going to launch this and we did launch it as a subscription and it was a much, much smaller setup in, in terms of the factory. And, I think there was a lot more manual blending involved, um, but obviously by now, you know, eight, nine years in, we've really developed that as a skill. But yes, it started off as a subscription, um, because I think especially then there was this starting to emerge, and that, you know, does save you, like, if you have a big dog, like 50 kilos of dog food, you don't have to carry home from the supermarket anymore. So it does kind of make sense to take the pain out of the purchasing. 